of the print soft cover. Today we have with us um, somebody who's written uh, extensively on partition, not just the book that we're going to discuss today, but earlier as well, Achal Malhotra. Her earlier book was published in 2017 uh, on the 70th anniversary of the partition. And the book we're going to sort of look at today is this, in the language of remembering, um, The Inheritance of Partition. Welcome, Archan, to the print. Thank you. It's such a pleasure to be here and speaking to you. Uh, so partition is a topic that obviously has been taken up, uh, at least in the academic discourse, a lot. Uh, there are extensive research centers across India which sort of look at it. So I wanted to know where would you place your book when we look at the existing literature on partition in India specifically? That's an interesting question. I think that now it's it's been about a decade since I've been uh, focused on partition as a topic. And the number of times people have told me that partition ends with the generation that has lived it is, you know, I can't even count that. But of course, this is not the case. This can't be the case because I belong to the third generation and I am invested in this subject in a way that it impacts me. And I know several other people that are impacted by partition that have not lived it. So I found myself repeating time and again that partition was not yet an event of the past, but I had never done any research to find out how or why that was, or I had never spoken to people uh, to see how partition was prolonged or whether people could feel it. So I, I think that you're right, while there are numerous testimony projects across India and across the world that preserve eyewitness memory, there are hardly any that shed light on the descendants of partition survivors. And I understand this because we have, you know, we have a time and space and we have distance from the event, from the site of trauma. So we can't feel exactly what our ancestors felt, but we feel shades of, I suppose, sadness or bitterness or pain or longing. And I think that um, while we assert importance to eyewitness accounts, we don't necessarily attribute the same seriousness to subsequent generations, but this archive needs to grow as well. This archive needs to grow because we need to understand how apart from the geopolitical, you know, consequences of partition, how has the event settled into memory, into family, into the relationships that we keep with people. Mm -hmm. And so I feel like maybe this is a new kind of lens for partition. I know there are some books in the past that have focused partly on descendant memory, but maybe not in their entirety. So, um, and then of course, how do you go around telling an inherited story? Because you are not hearing it from the mouth of someone who lived it, you're hearing it from someone who has heard the story. Mm -hmm. So I, I talk about, you know, the book is called In the Language of Remembering and what is that language? Mm -hmm. That language is, mediated by distance, by time, uh, by the ability to actually reflect on an ancestor's experience. It is the language of remembering the first time you talked about partition with someone. So, you know, uh, building on the title mm -hmm. itself, which is the idea of remembering. So you've worked with oral history a lot, even in your earlier book, right? So I was wondering if you could tell the audience, so what is the significance of oral history and memory specifically when it comes to, you know, talking or archiving the partition. I think the silence around partition is as old as partition itself. It is something that was practiced by a lot of witnesses because we don't really have a vocabulary to talk about trauma, not just of partition, but I think in general, we are building this vocabulary as we go along. Um, so, Oral history, I think it allows for the stories of people, of course, to be heard in their voice, mm -hmm. in the way that they want their story told, because for the longest time, we focus so much on archive, official archive of partition, statistical data of partition, in a way that the individuality of the survivor or what they had witnessed or gone through or overcome had sort of been you know, completely ignored. My people like my grandparents had become the data of partition. X number of people migrated, X number of people killed. And so I think it's very important to return to the person who actually migrated or witnessed horrors 
to understand their story. And I think perhaps the most incredible thing about oral history is that communities that have been marginalized or rendered invisible by official archive can have their story heard and recorded in a way that does them justice and with respect. So it is, it is hearing the story in their own words. And I think that oral history allows for a multitude of perspectives to be heard. Mm -hmm. So what you're getting, and in the case of partition, you need that because you know, it, I'm, I always find it very difficult to generalize the partition story. Mm -hmm. So oral history allows for that kind of diversity. Um, so how did you choose? There are a lot of chapters. It's a pretty uh, thick book. And there are like, even every chapter actually has a lot of voices, not simply that, uh, you know, there are multiple chapters and multiple voices, but you've chosen to name the chapters according to sort of like one human emotion, sort of. And then you have this multitude of voices probably talking about that emotion, right? So I was wondering, how did you sort of, you know, you must have done so many interviews, you know, so many journeys. So how, how was that like for you? And how were these chosen and eventually curated and sort of became a book after this? I think field research is my favorite part of writing. The writing is actually quite like, it's most painful. The field research is like an aspect of discovery because one story will always lead you to another story and something you observe, you may put in another chapter. So mm -hmm. I love that. The conversations for this book probably started around the same time that I was researching my first book. Mm -hmm. Because if I would speak to somebody and their children or grandchildren were sitting there, I would always ask them, have you heard this story before? Or are there things that you learned today? You know, and you would get kind of two different perspectives of the same story from two different age groups. And um, it was always, to be very honest, it was always side research. Because in my head, I was like, who would read, and I write about this in the book, that who would read a book of secondhand memory? Is there space for secondhand memory? Is secondhand memory taken seriously? Mm -hmm. So I would always archive these interviews and I would have these conversations. And then I think it came to a point where the number of times I heard people say, no one has asked us about this, you know, children or grandchildren, people of, of our age saying things like, you're the first person who's asked me about this with seriousness, or I feel very seen. I always wanted to talk about partition, but I didn't know if partition was my thing to talk about because I didn't live it. And I think that it came to a point where I started thinking, well, why isn't it our thing to talk about? Partition is my family history. I may not have lived it, but I certainly feel for it. And there are obviously enough people like me who also feel, they don't always feel the same thing, but they have some sense of emotional attachment to the subject, even if that may be rooted in, you know, othering or hatred or mistrust, or conversely, longing, belonging, sadness, pain. And okay, so I started compiling these interviews over a number of years. And then the challenge was, how do you put forth a mm -hmm. book of inherited stories? And naturally, the first thing that came to mind was, well, why don't we arrange them according to India, Pakistan, Bangladesh? And then I started thinking, well, you are moving away from divisive behavior in your interviews, mm -hmm. but you are dividing people anyway on the basis of you know region. So I decided to arrange all my chapters according to emotion, because that is something that is sort of uncategorizable in terms of nationality. Everyone feels pain, everyone feels love, everyone has some sense of hope, everyone has felt lost. So there are 24 chapters in the book and each of them are on the basis of emotion. Hmm. Um, in this way, when an Indian, Pakistani, Bangladeshi or a female male or a second generation, third generation or a Muslim, Hindu, Sikh, Christian interview are situated next to one another, they sort of show you in their totality the voices that come out of partition. You know, and, and they show you that there is real power in cross-border testimony. Mm -hmm. You cannot limit yourself to region or nationality or religion or ethnicity or caste. You have to understand in its totality what partition has done to people and continuing to do. Okay. 
So I'm going to ask something that uh, actually before that, I just remember because you mentioned something like, you know, is it my story to tell? So I remember when I was actually doing a course on Vietnam War, mm -hmm. this is one of the point that our professors talked about that the later memories of Vietnam War are not by veterans, you know, who were in the war. It was actually by the women who never went to war. It was by people who looked at war, who, you know, who had been influenced by that war much later. And then there was this whole discussion, apparently, even in academics, about the veracity of does only eyewitness uh, account and memory matter? Or is it equally, you know, do the accounts where people imagine, you know, what it could have been or, you know, must have been like, are equally important, actually, in understanding, you know, the kind of impact a war has on an entire country or a generation. I was just reminded of that when you mentioned that. It's such a good point as well, because I make the distinction in the book that mm -hmm. those of us who are speaking about our grandparents or parents cannot possibly feel the same emotion that they feel. Mm -hmm. But it is a way to empathize and try and understand and moreover learn from the experience. So the experience is not uh, directly ours, but there is a bequeathment of the experience mm -hmm. of passing down. And I think that passage of memory is actually quite beautiful. The intergenerational mm. you know, memory keeping. Um, it's something that I, I am an advocate for. I, I talk about it a lot because I do think that it is one of the ways in which we are able to uh, hold on to something that may be fleeting. You know, the generation that has lived through partition is now in its twilight years. And what will happen after they are entirely gone? How will we hold on to the past? So this, this other question, uh, simply because I think uh, I discovered it when probably I was doing this course in my college, which is one of Bush's book, I mean, not Bush's book, actually, uh, but, but uh, Shadow Lines, Shadow Lines is the book. And I think before Shadow Lines, again, in my imagination, for some reason, partition only meant the India-Pakistan partition. So again, I wanted to bring this up and ask, you know, your take on it, because even now, I think when we Think, think about partition, I think that is the Northern Belt is where we go and we think about that is the most, you know, traumatic event. We sort of forget what happened on the Eastern side of the country, that that those voices somehow don't get the kind of importance uh, for whatever reason, the way we give to the other side, mm -hmm. you know? So how, you know, how was it to balance out all of these voices? Because that's what a book does, right? You mentioned like India, Pakistan, Bangladesh. It's, it's not just two countries, actually three countries. But sometimes we conveniently forget, like I think every generation for some reason forgets this one particular country and this set of experiences altogether when we talk about partition. Well, the simple answer is that in the popular memory of Bangladesh, mm -hmm. 1971 holds far more prominence mm -hmm. than 1947. Memories of independence mm -hmm. overshadow anything that partition any consequences of the 1947 partition. Right. Um, but the answer is obviously far more complicated than that. Mm -hmm. I think, and I've thought about this a lot. I've thought about why we only focus on Punjab and not so much on Bengal, why we only focus on 47 and not 71. Um, what happened in the interim years to right. Pakistan to lead to 1971? And these are some of the questions that some interviewees definitely bring up in the book, particularly if their families have gone through multiple migrations, because that is possible as well. And I have to admit at the beginning, it kind of, you know, you have to unlearn many things as a scholar. And that is also a very humbling part of the research process that you understand that you don't know everything. And there is always something to learn from somebody. So I remember, this interview where someone said to me that I have family in India, Bangladesh, and Pakistan. And I said, well, how is that possible? And then I start to think to myself, a family that moved from India to East Pakistan at the time of the 1947 partition, hmm. further bifurcated during 1971, dividing between Bangladesh and Pakistan, scattering themselves over an entire land that was once unpartitioned and still remaining family in some ways, but disconnected by these fortified borders, militarized states. Um, and this idea of, of divided families, of people who had faced multiple migrations, of people who 
went through multiple partitions. So 71 was a partition for Pakistan, the division of Pakistan, which is something that I think Indians don't know how to comprehend yet. Mm -hmm. There was an interview, a, a really good interview that is in uh, the chapter on migration where uh, a woman who is my age, she's third generation, is telling me that uh, her grandparents witnessed 47 and her parents witnessed 71 in Bangladesh. And, you know, at the end of our conversation, I'm confirming facts with her that, okay, this happened and this happened and you migrated from here to there. And then I said, um, I spoke about her parents and how she said that, yes, my parents, you know, they, they met because of partition and she's of Pakistani descent. So I said, what do you mean your parents met because of partition, the 1947 partition? She said, no, the 1971 partition. And I had to pause and I had to think for a moment that I am Indian and she's Pakistani. And for her naturally 1971, is a partition of Pakistan. Mm. And I'm trying to explain this to her. And she said, well, what do you call 1971? And I said, the third India-Pakistan war. So you see the same year, 1971 is perceived in Bangladesh as liberation, as independence. For Pakistan, it is the partition of Pakistan. For India, it is the third India-Pakistan war. So if we, each of the three countries have separate understandings of what a historical year or an event means, then we're sort of recording pieces of memory, you know, mm -hmm. uh, and we are putting together the pieces in some way. I don't know, it's a very long winded way to answer your question. And I don't know if I have, but, you know, like I said, like one story always leads to another. Yeah, I think that is the whole point, isn't it? Like there is no one straight way of even answering this right. question. Absolutely. So again, one of my, um, then again, I have categorized favorites, more favorites are chapters of the book. I would love to know. Yeah. So one of my most favorite is page number 317, which is love. Um, for very obvious reasons, because it's love. Mm -hmm. And because I think, again, my memory of reading a lot of partition stories is through probably the framework of love and the stories which happened and which did not happen. That's beautiful. And it's rare because I've never heard that. Uh, I've always heard, and this is another reason why the emotions are so important because people mm. always categorize partition as violence. Mm. And I, I am indebted to my interviewees for looking at other avenues of understanding, perceiving and sharing partition, which mm -hmm. should not and must not be limited to violence only. Right. And um, so probably because there is so much trauma involved, probably that, or because I remember like doing a whole extensive year uh, during my own undergrad days where we would, you know, uh, look at this partition text and I was very new to it. So for every time I would read a story, I would get so emotional. I took days to actually get back to, you know, my normal self, which is why I think I also chose this way of looking at partition through these stories of love and loss, probably where I would feel like love still remains, you know, the memory of your beloved, you know. And I think one of the most powerful moments in the chapter is right at the beginning, where somebody remembers somebody's voice from so many years later. So I was wondering how, you know, how the experience was of curating that particular chapter, I think. Because you are talking about stories that may not have reached their end, in the way we understand a happy ending, quote unquote, probably. But there is an end. There is a sense of I don't know. I don't know. I wouldn't call it closure, probably. But, you know, dots connecting at some point. Maybe it's just somebody recognizing somebody's voice. That's one kind of love. Right. Um, and romantic love is another kind of love. Unrequited love is another kind of love. Love lost. Um, I'm, I'm thinking of what to say. Because to, to look at things to look at partition in a way that has not been looked at before, you need to literally change your perspective. Mm -hmm. And the first story in the chapter where uh, Professor Sen Gupta is talking about this voice that his brother heard, he also says, I'm deviating a bit. Hmm. He makes it. And I, I think, why, why are these kinds of stories deviations? Why are they not the first stories that are told? Why do we not have the idea that lovers you know, were pulled apart or brought together. So the chapter, I began imagining the chapter as looking at different ways of love. There is 
couples that got together because of partition, my own grandparents included, who met in a refugee camp, Kingsway camp in Delhi. There are couples where one partner died on the way mm. to the country that they adopted. There is an incredible story of a Bengali woman who married a Hindu Bengali woman who married a Muslim pilot and yeah. what they had to fight against in order to be together. And then there is also stories about the boundary of love, how partition created boundaries between who you could love and who you could not love and how this kind of um, dictated further generations of the family also. So that the story of heartbreak really. Um, but I love that chapter because I think that um, you're right. It shows you that maybe there are pockets of hope in places. Mm -hmm. And it, even as I'm thinking about it, I'm smiling because it completely changes the way you perceive this traumatic event. Um, so I was wondering, what do you think is, again, I understand that this, uh, that partition being such an event, we can't really put an end date or stop at a moment where, okay, you know, maybe everything is done now. Mm -hmm. There's nothing new. So I was wondering, what do you think is left? Like you've explored one area, the idea of inherited memory of how, you know, a generation is going to look back at partition, the one which hasn't explained. So I was wondering, have you thought of uh, more ways in which actually we can look at this event? And not just, again, not just in India, but probably across the three countries. I think that any moment that offers you the prism of memory mm -hmm. uh, also offers you some sense of infiniteness. When you look at historical events through the eyes of people, you will never run out of things to say or think about. Um, I already know people that are working on books about partition that I could have never imagined. A, a couple of years ago, I could have never imagined this book. So I think that, you know, different generations also have different ways of perceiving the past, which is equally as important, I think. Um, and it, there is space for all kinds of scholarship to exist. Mm -hmm. But I don't actually think we're going to run out of things to say about partition. We just need to find new ways to say them that make sense and resonate. So you have actually, like in some of the chapters, actually looked at certain uh, names. Uh, again, you know, somebody like Manto who's written so much about it. So I was wondering, do you have, let's say, favorites or people that you sort of go back to, maybe when you're working or generally looking at partition? I do, of course. And working on this book gave me tons of more mm -hmm. information because every interview also refers to certain things. They right. made about films, they made about books. Um, Manto comes up quite a bit, actually. Mm -hmm. And uh, do I have favorites? Jutha Such is okay. this voluminous 1,100-page novel written by Yashpal. It's, it's sort of, I would say, like the definitive partition novel when you think of Punjab. It was written quite soon after partition as well. And uh, I return to it often in one of my interviewees, who is also a novelist, Karan Mahajan, returns to it often. And let's see, what else? Uh, the Sixth River, which is a journal written during the days of partition by Fikr Tansvi, originally in Urdu, titled Chhata Darya, uh, translated by Maz bin Bilal into English, is something I return to often. And then the work of contemporaries. Anam Zakria is a Pakistani oral historian whose work I can't recommend enough. She has written on partition, on Kashmir, and on 1971. Kavita Puri, who writes on partition from the British perspective, another, another perspective we don't give enough importance to, I think. Um, what else? Kitne Pakistan by Kamleshwar, a really bizarre novel, but fun novel. I think that the list is never ending, but these are some things that I return to. Hmm. Okay. Um, Do you have a favorite partition book? <laughs> I was just thinking, later when you asked, I was asking you a question, in fact, when I was putting it down, I think I was thinking, I don't know, I think for some reason, probably because like I said, you know, it was in my first year that I came across 
probably ice candy man simply because i think yeah. there is a film and uh, probably it gave the most for me the most visceral disturbing image um uh you know from borrowed again from kushwan singh actually when she's uh, there is this idea of this train that uh, you know a train full of only dead people coming in and you know how that impacts and push for uh, push forwards the story uh, in ice candy man i think because the connection obviously because of that i ended up reading kushwan singh and then not sleeping probably for days on end because it was so horrifying but i think this other story interestingly for me was ghosts of mrs gandhi for some reason which oh. is borrowed actually uh, you know ghosh borrows and looks at actually the remnants of how like that one moment and then there is a trajectory of mm. probably also because i still live somewhere near kingsway camp which means you know i know so many people there who you know if you sit down and talk to them they'll actually go back and tell you about yes. um stories of partition but i think also that landscape of kingsway camp has transformed in a way that you won't find even a single yeah sort of when, you know because i did a very sort of a recce of the area very intense recce and everything from sign boards to is there an old wall somewhere <laughs> and then there is stay nearly 10 years in kingsway camp you know um it they were formative years of their life in an independent country and i wanted to see whether anything of that life remained and there's there's nothing i think except for the fact that um, again you know i think because i used to live in south delhi when i first came to delhi and for 3 years you know in a hostel and i would read because these places would crop up in the books i would read on partition so when i actually shifted to north delhi again that was also my you know when i got off the station you know the metro station and i'm looking around i think in my head i am trying to again find something that gives you an insight into okay you know these families have lived here yeah. for ages because i read dalrymple's this one particular chapter which is actually talking about you know his interaction with a lot of people who mm. you know been there in partition mm. and how he lived here for long interacting with a lot of these landlords who were originally actually people who you know moved migrated during partition uh, yeah. so i think uh, again for me it's difficult because i think i was immediately thrown into this whole uh, mm. aspect of literature Mm-hmm. but i think like i said i think uh, shadowland uh, shadow lines remain important because like i said it gave me an insight into what happened on the other side of it mm-hmm. how violence there again i am from the eastern side so i think it was very strange for me to you know figure that okay you have i don't have no memory of this mm-hmm. uh, the only time i remember my father talking about it because we are in assam and bengal is where you know it's happening and then bangladesh obviously borders assam we still have issues right well assam had a very complicated situation during yes that. which is why you know and my dad was studying in college when the war was happening and he says you know his memory actually interesting it's a very random memory that he has he says my memory is actually that we suddenly had a lot of hilsa fish in our hostel because uh indira gandhi said that you know refugees could come in and stay in ghati so he started in an iconic college cotton college and there was a huge field near the college where a lot of these refugees camped yeah. so in order to provide for food for them and because you know bengalis and fish so apparently indian government said get as much hills as you can because it's supposed to be a rare delicacy right and he said so it was overflowing the whole market in assam back then was overflowing with hills so it's that's what you know when i was reading your book that's what i thought this and you yeah. have elucidated the perfect example of oral history because that's not something you would ever find in any archival yeah. text you wouldn't you know um and i absolutely adore these details because they they actually give you the landscape you know um i want to mention here that there is an online journal called the partition studies quarterly okay. which focuses entirely on bengal and the northeast when it comes to partition and it's fascinating it's not a book it's something that people can just access free online but it is run by scholars and it's incredibly informative uh thank you archil for coming and talking to me and giving so many interesting insights into partition uh, apart from what obviously is already there uh, in your book and i really wish you all the best for this book and obviously for the other books that are yet to come Thank you so much it was a pleasure to speak to you and thank you for reading the book